You can read his title, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to spend a little time uh, talking to you today about a, a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart, Playa wetlands, which are the best wetland system that exists. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers of the class for inviting me. I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming. And I'd like to also extend a, an appreciation to my co-author, Dr. Gene Albanese, who is a postdoc over in the co-op lab. And um, he's the one that's done a lot of the quantitative work associated with what I'm going to show you. And what I'd like to do today is kind of step through um, kind of a conservation issue and how we looked at trying to solve that and relating to Playa Wetlands, a system that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, there are playas in Kansas, and they are very, very important in Kansas. Uh, but most of what I'm going to talk about is in Texas, but we're going to apply this stuff uh, throughout the rest of the Great Plains as well. But we do have a, a situation where we have a, a conservation need identified for these systems, but there is no way to prioritize or determine how to go about conserving these important wetlands. And I'm going to try to step you through the process of what we've been doing over the last four or five years. <clears throat> I started working with playas in 1988. Playas are very small depressional wetlands usually found in the high plains or the western great plains of the united states from nebraska down to texas and new mexico they're very small they're uh, discrete hydrologically isolated you'll read a lot about geographically isolated wetlands and they're a very important thing from a regulatory process won't get into that today but maybe that's something you you'll hear about some um, if you read about wetlands Precipitation is the sole primary hydrologic input to these systems. They are closed depressions, which means they are not physically connected to one another. And they're at the bottom of closed watersheds. And as a result, water, when it rains, flows into them. And then water is lost through aquifer recharge, as well as evapotranspiration over time. They have a very unique clay soil, which identifies them uh, on the landscape as unique from the remainder part of the of the soils. They are uh, flat bottomed, unlike most wetlands. They're very shallow, less than one meter deep. Again, very small in surface area, usually around um, three and a half to five hectares is on average, depending on where you are. Um, depending on which group or depending on which source you use, roughly about half of them are less than one hectare in size. Um, we usually don't worry too much about those um, <clears throat> from a conservation perspective. But you can see there's a lot of them. And there, we don't know how many there are. We don't know how many there are now. We don't know how many there were historically. But these small uh, depressional wetlands are scattered from Nebraska down into Texas and New Mexico, also found in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado. Uh, <clears throat> so this area of the High Plains is a very dynamic environment, very dry over there, subject to a lot of drought. Uh, you have environmental gradients. East to west, you have a, a precipitation gradient. North to south, you have a temperature or growing season gradient. And we also have a gradient of ecological knowledge. Uh, on the southern high plains, or that area of Texas and New Mexico south of the Canadian River, we have a considerable amount of ecological knowledge on playas. That's where I worked for a long, long time, or 25 years and still working there. Uh, in the central high plains, we have some ecological knowledge. In other words, the area between uh, I'd say I'm in Kansas now, so it'd be the Arkansas River and the Canadian River. And then north of there in the northern high plains, we have very little ecological knowledge of, of playas. And so that feeds into our lack of understanding of the role of these systems on the landscape. The landscape is very highly altered. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a prairie for about 11 million years. Uh, the current assemblage out there in terms of plant composition has been around for about 10,000 years. Um, however, during the past 150 years or so, there has been a tremendous amount or tremendous number of ecological state changes on that landscape, and another state change is coming into the future. So the landscape has changed quite a bit over the last 150 years or so. Playas are found in the high plains, and they are recognized as an important wetland system. Uh, things like the North American Waterfall Management Plan, the Playa Lakes Joint Venture, Great Plains Landscape Conservation Cooperative, 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Ecosystem Management, Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, and a whole lot of other government organizations basically have stated the playas are important. And so it's, it's well recognized nationally and internationally that these wetlands are vital. For example, this is a, a map, a recent map, an updated map of the important wetland areas in North America. And you can see right here, playas number eight, Playa Wetlands Region are listed there. And so they're, they're really important. Unfortunately, conservation <clears throat> has struggled. Playa, and one of the reasons why conservation has struggled is because playas are ephemeral. Uh, all wetlands are ephemeral by definitions, but playas take it up to another step. Most of you that are familiar with wetlands are probably familiar with the prairie potholes in the northern Great Plains, the duck factory. And those wetlands have a typical 8 to 12, 15 year wet dry cycle. And it's pretty well established. Well, playas do that on an annual basis. And so they are much more dynamic than any other wetland system. And so they cycle between wet and dry states. And sometimes the dry states will last for tens to hundreds of years, depending on where you are. So it's a very different type of wetland system. So why are they important? They provide a wide range of ecological services. And I think um, you recently had a, a presentation on what ecological services are or ecological goods and services. But what playas do is they are the primary area of biodiversity. Areas with playas have much greater biodiversity in terms of species richness and abundance than any other place in the high plains. It provides habitat, especially habitat for endemic species, a very important species, um, whether it's Anything from amphibians to inver in invertebrates and amphibians to migratory birds. They, one of the biggest um, <clears throat> services they provide is aquifer recharge to the High Plains Aquifer or the Ogallala Aquifer. In the southern part of the Great Plains, these are the only recharge points for that aquifer. <coughs> and as a result, loss of these wetlands um, really slows down the recharge ability for the aquifer. The unfortunate thing is, is that recharge, excuse me, <coughs> recharge is measured in millimeters or centimeters per year, and withdrawal from, these, from the aquifer is measured in feet per year. So it's not an equal system, so we're constantly losing water from the aquifer. <coughs> because playas occupy a big, large, flat landscape that don't have any associated rivers and streams, they are the primary source of flood control for the southern Great Plains, and to some extent, the central and northern Great Plains. So when you remove playas, that water has to go somewhere and tends to go places where people don't want it. It's a refugia for native plants. It actually uh, results in cleaning of water. Uh, the water, when it does recharge to the aquifer, is in much better um, shape uh, once it reaches that aquifer if it goes through a playa system. So what playas are important? The numbers of playas, again, vary depending on which source you have. Anywhere from 50 to 80 to 90,000 uh, playas exist. So which playas are important? Are they all important? None of them or some of them? And that's where the quandary is from a conservation perspective. So what makes one playa more important than another? Historically, we always looked at the value of playas from an ecological or conservation perspective by the degree of anthropogenic impacts. Do they have roads going through them, power lines going through them, pits dug in them, channels, irrigation, things of that nature. And so the, 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 the playas with the fewest amount or none in terms of ecological impacts or anthropogenic impacts would be considered a higher value than something else. That again has not translated into conservation success. So perhaps there are other criteria that we should use to judge the value of playa wetlands. Since the 1980s, uh, at least since the mid-1990s, there's been a consistent set of sound recommendations for conservation priorities for playas. It sounds pretty easy. We want the large ones, grassland watersheds, not cropland watersheds, and they get wet at a frequency greater than most other wetlands or other playas. And whether or not we get playas in high-density 
playa areas or low density areas kind of conflict, but it kind of depends on what your goal is for your conservation effort. And so we've kind of narrowed down the focus in conservation to these types of wetlands. But again, <clears throat> those wetlands efforts have been very ineffective. And one of the reasons why these conservation efforts have been effective is there's a total lack of understanding of these systems, ecologically, spatially, culturally, hydrologically. And there's a, a widespread unwillingness to learn because plies are so different from all other wetland systems and so few people understand them that it's hard to get widespread um, support for conservation of individual playas. And then when you look at the numbers of playas, whether it's 50, 60, 70, 80,000 that are out there, those numbers provide a mistaken impression that there is sufficient number of functional wetlands to meet societal needs. And so that perhaps we should concentrate our conservation efforts elsewhere. There's a lack of any regulations or legal protections of playas even um, incentives to protect them kind of uh, are non-existent at least since 2001 and so most conservation agencies despite the recognition the playas are important really don't know where to start there are a lot of plans out there that say we need to conserve playas but there are none that really talks about goals objectives how to implement monitor and fund conservation efforts for playas and this has been going on since Nine, at least 1989 when the Playa Lakes joint venture was started. And so here's the kind of the status of conservation in the High Plains. We recognize that they're important and a lot of place, people recognize that it is important. And there is a conservation framework that we need to conserve playas and at least some portion of their watershed associated with playas. And there's a general agreement that we need to conserve something. Where we want to get to we want to get to the point where we can recommend what to conserve. We want to recommend through reliable science or research those wetlands that frequently probably have some sort of uh, a good grassland watershed component, a high frequency of inundation, in other words wet state playas, and we want to do this under a long-term conservation process. Wetland management districts or WMDs are very important for geographically isolated wetlands. Um, and we want to have perpetual conservation, but we're not there yet. Where we are, are right here, and this is where we've been stuck <clears throat> for 25 years. We want to know where, how, when, and why to conserve playas. We need goals and objectives, conservation plannings, and there is a large dispute or disagreement on how to approach implementation, how to implement conservation of playa wetlands. Nobody can agree. Everybody has different ideas. So we're stuck there. And as a result, when you look at this sort of goal of what playa wetlands should we preserve within the wetland system to conserve connectivity and persistence of, of wetlands given limited resources and time, limited data, information, things of that nature, where do we start? And at this point in time, we really don't know where to start. And I bring up the idea here of a system, because that's really important to what we're, what we're talking about. But before I get to that, you have to remember that we don't control much about what goes on in the high plains. And what drives a playa system are extreme fluctuations in weather. And so we have these tremendous amounts of variability across time and space in terms of wet playas or inundated playas. And this is a graph of the percent of inundated playas on the southern Great Plains um, during January from 2001 to 2010. And you can see there's a great deal amount of variation. And so it's very difficult for people to say, okay, we want this playa because it's wet all the time and it provides uh, good wetland ecological um, benefits all the time. But you have to realize that all playas are different. They're all unique and they all have an individual hydrologic characteristic that results in a great deal of variation over time and so when we pull up and we have people with us and say and we tell them that hey that playa right there is a very good one we ought to conserve it and it's all dry and dusty because we were here in 2004 they go oh, we don't want to help you do that because it just doesn't look right but if you would have brought them there in 2005 during January 2005 it probably would have been wet and so 
Over across time, and this is a, a, a longer time period over a much greater spatial area, this is actually a Landsat imagery um, from the 1970s to 2011 that shows the proportion of plies that are wet uh, on the landscape on a much greater um, scale than individuals than what we showed before. And again, we have a great deal of variability uh, across time and even within years, because this above is January and below is June. And so plies change all the time. It's a very dynamic state. And here's a, uh, a set of photos that will show you that, um, where they can range from very, very dry to something that looks like a typical wetland. And this is a picture uh, of the same ply over a three-year period. So they're constantly changing. So it's hard to, to convince people to conserve plies when they're, when they're in this state, which is a common state, compared to the wetland state, which is actually a much rarer state. The other thing that's really hard for people to understand is that plies are transitional. And so most species, plants or animals, use plies for a relatively short period of time, and whether they're migratory or, or resident. So it's necessary to provide habitats so that ecological services can be provided elsewhere or in the future. And so in other words, we are, when we conserve playas, we're not only conserving for that individual playa at that time, but also for future conditions of that playa, as well as <coughs> surrounding playas or in case of migratory birds across an entire migratory pathway. And so playas provide spatial subsidies where effects on species are usually measured somewhere else or in the future. It's not a here and now type of an, an approach. And this will give you another kind of an idea about this, is, is that the stable ecological state of playas is the dry condition. And as it goes over time, that'll change during a major inundation event into a, a wet stage playa, or what we call an inundated playa. And that is an unstable state, as opposed to prairie potholes and most other wetlands where the wet state is a stable state, and the dry state is the unstable state. Playas are dry most of the time, and that's what's stable. And so when, the, when it rains and they flood, they, they kind of look like that. And then over time, they dry out and change during the drying process into a series of conditions that goes from a typical wetland to a mud flat to a dry system, and then back into the dry state. And so, <clears throat> from an ecological perspective, playas are dry most of the time, and that's a stable state. The wet state is unstable, it only appears for a short period of time, but that's a state that has the highest amount of biodiversity. So that's why we want to conserve these wetlands that have that high probability of inundation, which relates to precipitation gradients and watershed conditions. Um, even though the dry state is stable, it has a low amount of biodiversity, but it's still important. It still supports a lot of animals, plants and animals in that state. So why are we concerned about playas? Uh, even though everybody always talks about the high number of playas, the high number of playas is a misrepresentation of what's actually out there in the landscape. Some work that we've done recently, uh, if you use the idea of filling uh, of these small wetlands with sediment as a loss, then up to 60% of the historical playas are gone. They're cultivated or they're filled with sediment. Of the remaining playas, of that 40%, 93, 90, about 95% of them have reduced ecological condition, and about 90% of those are vulnerable to loss in the next 80 years, 85 years. There are no regulations or legal protection. The primary threat to playas is sedimentation, which is erosion from cultivated watersheds, moving material into these shallow wetlands, and filling them up. And it doesn't take too many rainstorm events to move a considerable um, uh, a mass of soil from the watershed into the playa, filling it up, and essentially re removing the volume, or 100% volume loss. If you do that, then when you reduce the hydro period, which is uh, and the depth of the water, which is the duration of that inundated period or that unstable inundated period, and it also reduces wetland quality, which impacts productivity, population structure, diversity, 
and distribution of animals across the landscape. So why don't people know what to do with playa conservation? All the playas look the same. They're all small circular wetlands out there that are basically the same. You know, if you look at them on an individual basis, they are the same. So how do you prioritize? <clears throat> How do you prioritize with dynamic conditions and change in ecological states with varying states across the landscape at any point in time? Any point in time, at any year, you can have a variety of different playas wet and dry, and the next year it'll switch across that entire gradient from Texas to, New Mex to Nebraska and east to west. And most playas are wet in January on average once every 11 years. There's a fleeting presence of most plants and animals, so it's very hard to do things like uh, get IBIs, uh, indicators of biological importance, and things of that nature, scores. It's very, very difficult because things are so dynamic and so transitory. And so <clears throat> if you look at the landscape, and this is a typical landscape um, where, the, where the playas are located. It's highly altered. It's changed from a short grass or in some cases mid-grass prairie to mostly cropland. A lot of it's irrigated because of the Ogallala Aquifer. But if you look on that landscape and where these blue dots are, are indicating where playas occur. There's a lot of playas on the landscape. They occur about, uh, on average, about one every square mile down in the southern part of the, of the region. And so you really can't do much of anything um, without impacting the playa. You can't build a road, you can't build a town. It's hard to farm, you can't even build a golf course without running into a playa. And so if you look at this, and this is a six by six, a six mile by six mile just uh, area just uh, east of Lubbock, Texas. And there's about um, 65, to, depending on how, what the screen shows, you know, a lot of playas there. And so <clears throat> what most people think of, oh, if you lose one of these playas, what's the big deal? Because you have a whole bunch of them elsewhere. And so you get in kind of the tragedy of the commons idea, where somebody says, it's no big deal if, I, if my playa is lost because there's a whole bunch of others. Unfortunately, that mindset is, <coughs> is ubiquitous across the high plains. And so you have a, a bunch of individual wetlands. And so how do you conserve this in this kind of landscape? Starting in the mid-1990s, I started thinking about a different approach. And that's a systems approach to these wetlands and how to conserve these, these wetlands from a systems approach. Because even though they are not connected physically, they are connected ecologically. And there's a lot of connections or links. And so the loss of one playa affects more than just that individual playa, it affects all the other playas around it. So the loss of one playa reduces the ecological value of surrounding playas. <clears throat> and so, and I consider playa conservation to have failed in the last 25 years. And the reason why is because we are considering planning and managing playas at the wrong spatial scale. <clears throat> the value of a playa, of an individual playa, is not at the individual level. It's at the system level. And therefore, uh, for effective conservation and management, we must consider the, the role of system-wide spatial temple dynamics to the persistence and the roles of individual playas in that effort. <clears throat> so we need a new approach to conservation of playas. We need to develop meaningful ecological objectives. We need to plan at larger spatial and temporal scales because things are longer than just every year at you know, in that particular playa. We need to realize that playas are different from all other wetlands and that extreme environmental <clears throat> conditions are normal and drive the system. It's okay if they're dry for a long period of time. It's not, not that big a deal. You're not wasting conservation dollars by conserving a dry playa. Because a dry playa is just waiting to get wet. Eventually it will get wet, and during those periods of that inundated or wet state, they are extremely important on the landscape. They're important as well when they're dry, but when they are, when they are in that wet state, um, we need to consider the role of the individual playas within the system. So if we look at the ecological value of the individuals to the wetland system, we can start prioritizing for conservation. And if we start looking at the relative contribution of the provision of ecological goods and services by individuals to the cumulative, then we can start showing that not all playas are equal at the system-wide scale. <clears throat> 
then we can start prioritizing locations for conservation. But how do you do that? How do you prioritize? How do you set this sort of, this sort of effort up from a system-wide perspective? Well, first off, you have to realize that the spatial structure of the Playa wetland system is characterized by physical patchiness. Playas are isolated on the landscape, and they're separated um, by a matrix of either grassland or cropland, or a matrix of upland. And that upland can be either uh, cropland or grassland. It's about 50%. If you look at it in, uh, in the entire Great Plains or the High Plains, it's about 50% cropland and about 50% grassland in terms of what the matrix is between. Obviously, those playas that are in a matrix of cropland are a much greater threat to due to sedimentation processes than those that are in grassland. And then you also have to think about the idea that the playa wetland system is a continuous transient dynamic system where you have precipitation as a lone hydrological input and the presence of water or inundated playa states is required for that playa to function as a wetland. And so <clears throat> precipitation patterns and the patterns of wet state playa depressions, I'm going to keep talking about wet state playa depressions because it's really important in this effort that I'm going to show you, within the regions vary across space and time. And that's normal. That's typical. That's a characteristic of this system. And so we need to figure out how playas are important what individual playas are important across the entire system? And that depends upon the scale of ecological processes. Some playas are very important for what we call fine scale or local processes. Those things, you know, the, the playa and its surrounding playas, or what I will eventually call a subnetwork. Some playas are important for broad scale processes, or things, or processes that go across the entire landscape. And you can see here this, this kind of this trail or this pathway. That's a broad scale ecological process. That's things like immigration, emigration of individuals, movement of propagules, and genes across the landscape. That's broad scale. So we need an uh, analytical approach to measure connectivity that has metrics for both broad scale and fine scale ecological processes. So we want to identify those playas that are important for fine scale or developing subnetworks, as I will show you, and those playas that are important for broad scale or pathways across the entire system. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about network theory and analysis, but we can use network theory to do this. And that simplifies as what network does, theory does is it simplifies complex systems into levels within a hierarchy. It's well known in the physical sciences. It's starting to be somewhat well known or used. It's used a little bit in the ecological sciences, but it's limited in terms of how many individual points we can use in the network system. The historically, what most from an ecological perspective is the most points or what I will call nodes that have been used in network analysis have been measured in a couple hundreds, or two or three hundred. We're talking, we're in, we're in the 25 to, to 80,000 range here. And so what Gene Albanese did is he came up with a new, unique and novel way to do network analysis <clears throat> on large scale networks. And he did this through the use of percolation theory. And I'm, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about percol percolation theory. But it is a way, it's a, theoretical, it's a theoretical model to understand the topological effect of removing nodes from a network or playas from the landscape. And we can then, through the use of percolation theory, is we can assign values to individual playas, quality, and see what happens to the network once we start removing them. And so it becomes a probabilistic approach of connecting links across an entire network. Um, and there, you have multiple concurrent network algorithms that work together simultaneously to do this. So whenever we would do a run, sometimes with our servers and a bunch of computers hooked up to it, it would take two to three weeks to run a single simulation of the stuff that I'm about to show you. 
So the idea about network percolation, which is characterized by power law theory or behavior, is that we can identify transitions. And what transitions are is where a phase goes from a fragmented into a subnetwork or into a larger network. And so we can identify points when the network that is fragmented or individual plies when it starts to become connected. And that is all based on what we call on a scalar distance. It's a physical thing. It's the, it's the, it's the relationships on the landscape. It's a physical distance from one plier to another. In an ecological perspective, we call this dispersal distances, or how far individuals can move. Things like plants, they can't move very far one at, at, at one period, because obviously their propagules have to go. Toads and amphibians move to small areas, like you know, 500 to 1,000 meters. Birds can move much larger. Resident birds, you're talking 5, 10 kilometers, and <clears throat> migratory birds, you know, hundreds of kilometers. So how these individuals perceive a network depends upon their scalar distance. And so you have to do this type of analysis across the entire potential um, distances that are ecologically important. So small distances are important for plants, amphibians, things of that nature, and then that goes up in a gradient. But we're able to use percolation theory to take those points or figure out where those points where individuals become subnetworks and then isolated subnetworks become dominant networks or larger networks. And we do this using a topological network representation where the points are the plyo locations, so you have to have exact locations where they are at, and the links are the edge, uh, the lines are the edge are, are actually the links that connect these distances or these playas and measured in some distance. And this is typically where um, <clears throat> network analysis stops. And so what we end up having is if you throw all your points together, all the playas together as one network, and then there are a series of subnetworks underneath that, and then there are paths between the nodes or the individual playas um, <clears throat> along contiguous links um, in which no point is revisited that basically allows us to estimate pathways, the shortest pathways across a network of nodes and links. And so it's a hierarchical um, ap approach to doing this. However, there are other ways to do connectivity. What I just explained to you is what's called uh, structural connectivity, which is the spatial patterns with no reference to ecological processes. So basically we treat all playas the same, we assume that they exist on the landscape, and then <clears throat> it becomes a physical or a structural or just a spatial analysis. Then you also have what's called functional connectivity, which is where we measure spatial patterns with reference to ecological processes. And that's measuring the biological patchiness of the system and then we have to start putting quality measurements on these individual playas. And so what we need to do this analysis, we need the exact number of playas, which is not easy to get. We need the exact location of the playas, which is not easy to get. And those two things took us 18 months just for the air. This is what I'm going to show you. We need a playa quality, which is P. It's important to remember P and H. And we need a playa quality which is basically based on sedimentation depth. I'm not going to go into how we did all of this, but it's basically based on sedimentation depth. It's a quality measurement or a functional measurement. And we need dispersal distance, H, <clears throat> which is the distance that we want to investigate that network relative to the ability for something to move. And so you start off with um, the entire Great Plains or Western Great Plains playa system. And this is a map of the playa quality aspect of it, where previous researchers, Lucy Burris and Susan Scoggin up at U, um, USGS and Fort Collins, came up with a map of how long it will take individual playas to fill with sediment based on 
a variety of watershed characteristics and things of that nature. And so we use this as the quality measurement. So each individual playa has a score based on its probability of being filled with sediment. So it's a quality measurement. And then we also combine that with locations along a precipitation gradient that talks about the probability of playa inundation. And so we know that things on the eastern side will flood more frequently or inundate more frequently than the stuff on the, on the western side. But we have a probability of playa inundation for each playa. So you combine the probabil probability of playa inundation along with um, time to filling, and you get, a, you get the p-value of playa quality across the landscape. So what we wanted to do is model and examine the connectivity patterns for playas on the southern Great Plains. Or in other words, the changes to the structural and functional connectivity of playas in the southern Great Plains, and then identify the playas critical to the maintenance of that entire system. <clears throat> and so we first started off doing this from a structural perspective, where we built a reference network uh, of the entire Great Plains, wet um, Great Plains wetland network, which basically is all connected at 20 kilometer dispersal distance. So all the entire system is connected at 20 kilometers. And then as you back up that H parameter or that distance parameter, you start to see the observance of subnetworks. And what's really important here is that <clears throat> there's a, we want to partition um, the wetland nest network at, at particular quality and uh, quality measurements across a distance measurements. And we did it with two kilometers, four kilometers, 10, 16, and so on. And you'll see that really early on in this effort, this area right here, or this area, the southern high plains, came out, especially at four kilometers, as its own sub dominant subnetwork across the entire landscape. And so that's kind of where, that's where we started. <clears throat> and so this Texas Playa wetland network, there's 24,388 wetlands in that network. There's almost um, 3 million potential links at a distance out to 15 kilometers. It covers an area of 251,000 square kilometers. Um, and so we have, this is where we have most of our information, if you remember earlier on. This is where we have most information. So we're pretty confident that these playas are on the landscape <clears throat> and they represent the highest density of playas in the Western Great Plains. And it is a definitely identified structurally um, isolated major subnetwork. And so then we went on to build that reference network um, <clears throat> from basically uh, using quality measurements, a probability of inundation and other things, ranging from zero, P from zero to one. So the proportion of, of wetlands within a wet state at a particular time across um, scalar distances from two to 15 kilometers and basically simulated this you know, 88,000 times. I'm not going to get into kind of how we did it. But <clears throat> the important thing is, is that the Texas Playa Wetland Net, uh, Network is characterized by small clusters of wetlands. In other words, subnetworks at small clusters at about, um, a pro at about an inundation frequency of 40%. And a distance, scalar distance from four to, you know, right around between two and five kilometers. So when you get up to greater than five kilometers of distance, the entire network starts to come together into one network, <clears throat> even when the, the probability of inundation is low. So you can have a probability of inundation of the proportion of wetlands in a wet state down to 2% or 20%. And if, you got, if you're capable of dispersing greater than five kilometers, that network, if it exists, if all the playas were there, was available to you. And so this is, and I'm not going to, again, go through a whole lot of, of things here on this graph, but this is actually the really important graph. And so you, this graph shows you the, both the broad scale and fine scale processes. 
So when you have a dispersal ability of two kilometers up here in the upper left, and that graph is above that um, horizontal line there, that shows that you, at two kilometers, no matter what the distance is, um, no matter uh, how many, what proportion of the playas are wet, basically you just have a bunch of scattered, smaller networks out there. They never all come together. However, when you get out to three and four kilometers, especially four kilometers, which is the really the important one here, is that at, at, when you have a dispersal distance of four kilometers and a probability of, of or the proportion of the playas that are in the wet state at, two, at 20 percent, then everything forms a bunch of smaller clusters or smaller subnetworks. And then as the probability of inundation or the proportion that are inundated increase, then you start to see this part, this area below this vertical line, which, which tells you that pathways across the entire system are being formed. So linkages across that entire system start to emerge at dispersal distances of four kilometers and probabilities of inundation um, <clears throat> right around two to four, or 20 to 40 percent. <clears throat> And so um, this basically shows uh, what, I just, what I just mentioned is that at four kilometers, you have dense clusters forming across the network as you increase the proportion of playas that are wet. So where we're interested in networks of inundated playas. And so as you increase the proportion of playas that are wet at any point in time, um, you start off forming a bunch of smaller subnetworks and then bang, right about between 30 and 40 percent. Once that happens, then you have a connectivity or pathway all the way across that network. And so <clears throat> because playas have um, a very low probability of inundation, the important take home message from this is that the sheer number of playas and the dynamic inundation um, events spatially create a redundant system. It's re there's a redundant global pattern of highly co uh, connected localized clusters. So even when you have relatively few wet state playas, the system still functions because it's a redundant system that has developed over time in this very dynamic environment. And so that redundant system insulates the network from collapse by minimizing the function of complete loss and of <coughs> I mean, insulates the, the playa from collapse at any point in time by, minim, uh, by minimizing the probability of loss of function across the entire landscape. And I'll get to this in a little bit, but basically we show here the relatively important playas to that effort. We can do that now that we've got to this point. But this redundancy in fine and broad scale connectivity goes across scales, and it goes across time. And so we can look at something, you can look at the distance measure and the quality measure and do this across time, um, and redundancy and resilience happens across time. Because you've got to look at this across not 10 years, not 20 years, but hundreds of years. And so those patterns of these pathways that emerge across the system across time um, are based on a combination of the distance or the dispersal ability as well as the um, quality measure. And so there's a phase transition where the network acts as a bridge linking these dynamics through time and it's redundant. And so <clears throat> you can lose a lot of playas or a lot of, you don't have to have a lot of playas in that wet state for these connections to happen as long as all the playas exist. So given that there is low probability of inundation in most wetlands, there is a multi-scale pattern redundancy that shortens the duration of temporal isolation. But what playas are important for that? And you can see here that over time, if you have something like a toad, you basically have a metapopulation effect where you have playas that are in wet states, playas that are in dry states, and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they form clusters. But if um, you have animals that are, but if, if these clusters are 
close enough within a dispersal distance for that species, whether it's plants, frogs, toads, birds, or whatever, then things start to connect, and then over time, everything connects. So it's, it's a, it's a long-term connectivity that we're interested in, maintaining that long-term connectivity. So how do we identify which plies are important for that? We use what's called a dam uh, damage process model. And this is commonly done in physics. I don't think it's ever been done in ecology, where uh, we identify plyo wetlands with the greatest contribution to maintaining global um, connectivity. And we weight each plyo and then remove it. We, we weight each plyo based on quality and then remove it through a series of simulations to estimate the differences in the magnitude of flow as, um, or movement that's capable for each playa as a, a directed output link. This all makes sense in a minute. Okay. So <clears throat> most of you have probably heard about bivariate exponential um, decay functions or weighted dispersal kernels. But what Gene did, again, is nobody else has done this before, is he, for every playa that's out there, at every potential dispersal distance, he was able to put a weight on the links. Not on the nodes, which is what we did before, but on the links. So in other words, how much that playa contributes to um, the network. And so you have a distance parameter and a volume parameter, and then you're able to weight a link. And when you do that, you can start um, incorporating things like habitat quality, um, which I talked about a little bit earlier, but this is um, the habitat quality is based on sedimentation rates um, that was done. And then we can take that bivariate distance decay kernel and center it on in each playa and weight it by the probability of inundation and habitat quality. And then you get a wide variety of different um, groupings based on your distances your dispersal distances, and then you start removing them individually, one at a time, and see how all this changes. And then once you figure out the relative importance of individuals, you can start ranking them. And so we did this for both fine scale connectivity and, and broad scale connectivity. This might not mean much to you, but in the fine scale stuff, we use the metrics for degree centrality, which is the number of links within that uh, node. So in other words, how clustered are the playas, or how important is that playa to the individual clusters? And we did it for what's called Petrinus centrality, which is the number of shortest links in that network that pass through that individual playa. Um, playa. So you get a pathway across that network. And so we combine both of these into figuring out which playas were important to both of them. And so <clears throat> we did target damage process removal. And we took, uh, and through hundreds or thousands, actually tens of thousands of simulations, figured out this is for the um, fine scale, this is for the broad scale, these are the important plies for each of those individually. Um, but then you combine that through um, <clears throat> a damage process by removing them and then seeing what happens to the remaining plies around there or in that cluster or in that pathway. And then you can start identifying the degree, uh, weighted degree rank for each, or the between, between this rank for each one of those processes, and essentially go up to removing 40% is where we ended up going. So we basically randomly took you know, plies in and out of this model over you know, tens of thousands of simulations and calculated you know, their individual ranks based on their contributions to these metrics. And you can see that when you start damaging the network, um, the reference network here is a solid line. This is the re this is you should have seen. This is what you I showed you earlier. This is assuming all the playas are present. You start damaging that network um, and targeting playas that have greater values for betweenness and degree cent and tr centrality for removal or preservation to figure out which ones have the greatest impact in network level percolation, you can start to see that um, 
you're getting to the point when you start to remove them, you don't see any of these damage graphs below the, that horizontal line, which means that long-term pathways are no longer existing. Once you start removing these individuals or this damage model, then you lose the long-term pathways. We still have isolated subnetworks forming, but it forms at greater probabilities or proportion of individual playas that are wet. So you go from this peak, or in this case, when you combine everything, you go from that peak to that peak. So in order for the, the dominant subnetworks to form, historically you had to, you had to have 20% of the playa is wet. Now, if you damage it, if you remove 40%, and remember, we think that 60% are gone. If you remove 40%, then you got to have 40% um, of those wet. And if you do that, you, you, you never regain that pathway across that entire system under any circumstances relative to dispersal distance or, probability or habitat quality. And so <clears throat> we did this across time. Um, because you realize that that sedimentation value or that loss of playas due to sedimentation was across time. And so we targeted the playa wetland network uh, out in the future from current 2010 or recent up to 2100. Um, and then looked at the percolation value change and a bunch of other stuff. But essentially what it ends up is right now, um, this is, the, again, the reference network um, behavior. This is, if we can, this is what's left, if we, can, if we are going on with what is left. The amplitude of what's currently out there is uh, in terms of being able to form subnetworks or the proportion of that system that becomes subnetworks is much, is much lower now than it ever was before. Uh, this, is, this is where we're at on that graph right now. This is where we're going to be in the future um, based on the availability of, of wetlands. And essentially, <clears throat> the, the, the ability of that network to perform is lost um, and it's starting to crumble. So <clears throat> we, we, we kind of um, have the idea that the critical threshold for Maintaining a, a superior network or a, a constant network is already lost. And so these cascading failures, there's been a macroscopic breakdown of connectivity patterns, both in terms of spatial um, or structural and functional. And that is starting to impact, from an ecological perspective, things like movement strategies, population dynamics, biodiversity, and things like that. So you're starting to get isolation in the system. If playas are, are gone from the system at the rate that we think they are, and they're going to leave the system at the rate that we think they are, we're going to get increasingly more and more isolation. <clears throat> so connectivity is resilient and redundant to the removal of almost 60% of the playas, but you can't, they're not all equal. So in other words, the system would still function with 40% of the playas remaining, but it has to be the right 40%. And most of those are already gone. But just remember that 40% number is really important. So not all playas contribute equally to the connectivity of the system. Um, the important playas depend on where the, the interest is in fine or broad scale processes. We combined it for what I'm about to show you. Uh, but you can do it for either, you, you, can, you can prioritize or rank playas for whatever process you're interested in. And then you have um, current and predicted functional, um, future functionality affects the contribution to the system. And so the upshot of the whole thing is this is what we did. Because you can, the, the, the system can function with 40% of the playas remaining, we identified those 40% that has to be remaining. We identified and ranked the 40% of those playas in the Texas um, wetland network from one, I think it's to 4,000, in terms of their quality, and future quality scores, and current quality scores right here for conservation people. So we actually now have 
if you go back to my original problem in the beginning, where do we start with conservation of playas? Right here. We have it now. We have all the prioritized locations of playas, what their current state is, what their future state is. So you can look at conservation, you can look at restoration. And you, if we can get those 40% remaining on the landscape, then the system will function. You lose them because we do have some, you know, if you look over here, we do have some that are zeros, so they no longer contribute to the, to the system. Then the, fun, then the system is starting to fall apart like we think it is now. <clears throat> now, many of you will say, oh, what's the big deal? It just plies out in the western part of the United States. Big deal. Well, it is, um, playas are very, very important, but it's kind of a learned or an acquired taste. And, but if you go back to people, even back in the 19, 1830s, they talked about what a wonderful part of the world this is. Zebulon Pike indicated that it was too grand and sublime to be imagined. Um, Bray, of the British, Bray and Curtis fame, talked about the, the, the senses and the power of the vegetation of this landscape, just the entire landscape. And then you had a guy in 1836, um, which is what I'd like to leave you with today, that if you just listen to people like me, or even if you just drive through that area, you'd probably um, remain in ignorance of the importance of this region. In order to appreciate it and understand it, you got to go out and visit it. Thank you.